Kraft, president of the City Club. Welcome, and welcome to our special program today, keeping Oregon connected in the global economy with our favorite guy, or at least our favorite Port of Portland director, Bill Wyatt, who is the executive director of the Port of Portland. Looking forward to hearing uh, from him. Uh, would everyone be kind enough to turn off their cell phones and other noise-making devices right now so that we won't be disturbed? Thank you. Uh, breaking news on our next Friday forum, it was going to be another Mystery Friday, but we have just learned that we have lined up three crack investigative reporters who will speak about what the public should know about the future of PGE. Uh, the three reporters are Nigel Jackwis from Willamette Week, Christina Brenneman from the Portland Tribune, and Jeff Manning from the Oregonian. So that is breaking news as it goes that we will be up to date with what these people have learned by next Friday. Now just a brief uh, overview of the club activities that are coming up. All of the information is available in the bulletin and on the website at pdxcityclub.org. You can also go to that website if you want to blog about any of the topics. Uh, next week are um, community strategy forums, which are related to Peter Hutchinson's work with Multnomah County, will resume. The Illahee Post Lecture Discussion Series will continue on February 17th. And our monthly book club, the next selection of which is Death and Life of Great American Cities by Jane Jacobs, uh, and that will be moderated by Chet Orloff, will be on February 28th and uh, that's over here at City Club Commons, and it is co-sponsored by Portland Streetcar. Now, you also have a new opportunity for uh, advocacy. The PDC report, research report was adopted last week by a vote of greater than 80% of the members president, and consequently, their recommendations became the official position of the club. So the club can now advocate on those recommendations, and anyone who's interested in becoming part of this advocacy group could, should contact Chris Smith, who's chair of the Advocacy and Awareness Board. You can get his phone numbers or um, email off the website or call the office. We're also looking for candidates of the Board of Governors. We have gotten some good input from our membership as a whole now, but we are looking to broaden the uh, base of our Board of Governors, and so we're asking members to submit names of other members or other community leaders that you think might be uh, very helpful to us on, in our mission at City Club. If you have any suggestions for that, would you please contact Wendy Rodmacher Willis, our Executive Director. We will, I'd like to now introduce Jake Okenberg. Jake is our chair of the membership committee for City Club, and he's going to uh, kick off the new membership, um, what do we call it, the membership campaign. Jake Okenberg. Hello. Today we are kicking off our membership drive, and it's going to run from today through June 3rd. It's been uh, actually several months since I last spoke to you and just wanted to give you an update that over about the last year, year and a half, we've increased membership by over 200 members, which is just a great accomplishment. Our goal between now and June is to do that again, bring in 200 more members, and I think it's something that we definitely can do. And we can do it keeping in mind some of the things that uh, Corlene just mentioned when we're thinking about our board, which is making it more broad, more diverse, representing all of the city. And so these are the things I think we can do and we can keep in mind. Well, how are we going to do that? We're going to be announcing several initiatives, several programs throughout this membership drive, and I'll let you know about those. But a few things today I wanted to tell you about. First, you're all being deputized as members of the membership committee. It's the easiest way for me to do my job is if I have 100, 200, 1,400 people all helping me out. And so you all do it already. Bring your friends, bring your family, bring them to a, a city club events and encourage them to become members. You're all our best network to start with. Uh, and also, uh, as, as, a, as a point there, many of you were at our last final Friday. It's the first time that we've done that. The last Friday of every month after the Friday Forum, we meet at the new space, City Club Commons, 9th and Washington. And it's a chance for you to bring out potential new members as well. See our physical space. See that space for yourself if you haven't yet, which is just fabulous. And get people interested in what we're doing. So that's number one. You're all going to help. Number two, we know that many people who come to great forums like today's with Bill Wyatt 
are not members. They're interested in the topic of the day. Well, we'd love all of you to become members. In fact, we know that at some times we have more than 50% of the people in the audience are not members. It's very easy to join. There's membership brochures in front of you. If there aren't, there's at the back. In fact, if Doug and Bonnie would wave back there, you can say hello to them, and they will help you out. Today and today only, we will waive the membership fee if you turn in your membership today. So that's what we're going to do. The second thing. Third and last thing that I'm announcing today, which is very exciting, all people who are part of an organization or a business, many of you already have this already, companies who are great supporters of City Club, if you bring in five members during our membership campaign, and actually we're going to continue this for the rest of the year and continue it if it's successful, we'll waive the membership fee for all those members. So just bundle them together, bring them to someone in our office, and we'll waive the membership fee. I'm getting a, I'm getting a shit. We're just going to do this for, for right now. New membership. Correct. I didn't say new. No, you didn't say new. Correction. New membership fee. We're not giving you a refund. So, uh, if I didn't make that clear. So, and uh, finally, um, we'll be unveiling several things in the coming weeks. And you won't just be hearing from me. You'll be hearing from the great members of our membership committee and our board. So thank you all and your help. Well, we have our ways, too. We got Bob, Bob Applegate, who was our moderator last week, was not a member. And he asked questions without being a member. That's just not done. So Bob Applegate is now a member. Thank you, and welcome, Bob. Our sponsors this quarter, co not coincidentally perhaps, are Nike, Portland General Electric, and Preston Gates and Ellis LLP, and we're very grateful for their support. They help sponsor these programs. Now on with our program, Keeping Oregon Connected to the Global Economy. Bill Wyatt knows a thing or two about Oregon, since as a native Oregonian he's been active in the state and regional political and business circles over the last 30 years. He served in the Oregon House of Representatives from 1974 to 1976, and he later served as president of the Oregon Business Council and executive director president of the Association for Portland Progress. He then acted as chief of staff of Oregon Governor John Kitzhaber for seven years before coming to be the executive director of the Port of Portland in 2001. He knows more than a thing or two about the global economy since the port, the second oldest port on the west coast, provides facilities and services to move cargo and people through its five marine terminals and four airports. Did you know we had four airports that they oversee? It's Portland International, of course, Troutdale, Hillsboro, and Milano. Although the port boundaries are limited to Multnomah County, Clackamas, and Washington counties, its impact is felt throughout the northwest in terms of supporting thousands of jobs and strengthening the region's economy. Please welcome Bill Wyatt. Thank you uh, very much, Corlene, and thank you to the City Club for, uh, for having me back. I enjoy this forum very, very much, and I, I guess I just want to add my own uh, kudos to the club for coming back downtown. I think it's great to have the, the city club uh, <clears throat> in the heart of our city, where it belongs. Well, there's an old Chinese uh, proverb uh, that goes like this. The man who waits for a roast duck to fly into his mouth must wait a very, very long time. There are really two reasons I wanted to open uh, with this. First, it's Chinese. and. <clears throat> We're about everything Chinese these days at the port, paying a great deal of attention to China and to the remarkable, uh, some would say, astonishing growth of the Chinese economy and its impact on us here in this region. Uh, but more importantly, I think it reflects as well uh, the fact that we're not waiting around for that roast duck to fly into our mouth at the port. We're making changes. We're adapting uh, to this remarkable global economy that all of us find ourselves buffeted by to one extent or another. So I want to uh, share with you today the port's perspective on the value of uh, retaining and growing our region's role in international trade and, and let you know a little bit about what we're doing about it because, uh, as I said, this is a period of enormous change. First, let me share some impressions of China as it has become the poster child for globalization, outsourcing, uh, and free trade. Uh, 
The world is focused on China for good reason. Now think about this. Including the former republics of the Soviet Union, India, and China, one half of the world's population live in countries uh, which have embraced some reasonable facsimile of a Western-style free market economy within the last 10 years or so, those three countries alone. So if you wonder why there is so much attention, dislocation, and discussion regarding globalization and the fate of our own economy, I think nothing really captures the underlying context better than this one uh, dynamic. Today, China has full access to global information technology, modern uh, productive capacity, rapidly developing transport infrastructure, advanced educational institutions, uh, evolving financial markets, and most importantly, an increasingly well-educated, skilled, and very motivated workforce. Its economy is growing at a breathtaking rate. That's not to say that everything is well in China. They have enormous challenges, uh, but as a new entrant on the global stage, uh, they represent an obviously formidable uh, force. Uh, for example, consider the growth of foreign direct investment. The Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco reports that investment grew at an annual pace of 17 percent, 17 percent over the last four years, and last year exceeded 25 percent. In 2003, exports and imports flowing through our harbor to and from China ranked third with 221 million in exports and 1600 uh, or 600 million in imports behind trade leader Japan and number 2 South Korea expect however for those numbers to change and to change rapidly by the end of 2003 China's gross domestic product grew at an annual rate of 10% Contributing to this GDP growth is significant and sustained export growth, which has been rising at a rate of close to 30 percent over the last two years. Currently, our largest trade gap is with China. It's, 16 .6, uh, it's a $16.6 billion gap, more than double the next largest, uh, with Canada and Japan each at about $7.5 billion. If you want to know why, look in the mirror. American consumers, and Oregonians are no exception to this, are voting with their wallets and choosing low-cost merchandise <clears throat> largely manufactured in China and other emerging economies in Southeast Asia. From the food you eat to the cars you drive to the clothes you wear, uh, and yes, even the new post-Panamax container crane that we in the port are in the process of buying, the impact of China's economic uh, output is ubiquitous. And the central question these issues raise is, what does it mean for us? Do we in Oregon benefit from global trade? Or in the long run, is free trade, especially with the Chinese behemoth, simply a race to the bottom for our standard of living? I think reasonable people can and do clearly disagree about the answer to this question. In truth, our relationship with China is immensely complex and not well explained by the typical soundbite or jingoistic slogan. Well, it isn't really the port's job to resolve this debate. Trade is obviously at the very heart of our existence. One thing you can't argue about is that trade will only grow. It won't shrink. Companies are global. Production is global. Consumption is global. Our challenge is how to ensure that it works to our advantage. And I'd say as of this time, there are clear reasons for optimism and some reasons for concern. Portland and Oregon in general are coming out on the winning side uh, of world trade for two reasons. First, the business that global trade drives through our region, and second, the economic model it sets up where our employment is high skill, high wage, driven in no small measure by an entrepreneurial spirit which few other countries have yet been able to replicate. This is not to suggest that everyone is a winner, but in general as a region, we've done well. Of concern, of course, is that a high-skill, high-wage economic model uh, requires a continuing strong investment in all levels of education, something both our state and our nation are faltering in. Uh, and furthermore, it requires that employers who want to be engaged in the global economy have access to a global workforce. Our nation's policies around immigration represent an immediate threat to our continued economic success. 
Finally, I would say that doing business uh, in a rapidly evolving and developing country like China can be enormously challenging. Uh, our region is full of companies who've had direct experience with this. Without broad recognition for long established legal tradition around such things as trademark and copyright laws, companies whose foundation rests on proprietary technology or brand recognition are always at risk. In terms of just sheer volume and economic impact of global trade in our region, consider some of the numbers. We're the number one auto import port on the West Coast, a fact we celebrated with Toyota recently uh, as they opened their new state-of-the-art $40 million auto processing facility. This year, Portland will import nearly 400,000 automobiles through our facilities. In an effort to speed the connection between consumer and car, all of the foreign manufacturers are doing an increasing amount of accessory installation on the dock here, a fact which has increased the jobs associated with our import facilities. And this is a phenomenon that you will see uh, increasingly as time moves forward. The Columbia River is the largest wheat export system in the United States, drawing grain from as far away as Kansas, Nebraska, and the Dakotas. And owing in part to the falling dollar uh, and increased imports by the Chinese, we're having the best year in a decade. Our exports of soda ash and potash are increasing. These are two of the most basic industrial building blocks, and we export them to points all around the globe. We moved nearly 12 billion in waterborne trade through uh, 2003, and overall marine and aviation activities influence more than 150,000 jobs in this region. The annual economic impact of the port operated oop, sound. Can you hear me now? Huh? A little closer. Try that. Something did just uh, click off. off, yeah. Not sure what it was. I'll just try to talk a little louder. <clears throat> um, overall, the economic impact of the port is about four and a half billion dollars annually uh, on this region. And finally, and I think this is uh, no surprise, Oregon is the, mo is the eighth most tra trade dependent state in the United States. Uh, and. Uh, this may be of surprise to people. Washington is the first. So here we are on a border with a state which is the first uh, most trade dependent state in the United States, and we in Oregon are the eighth. So trade is an enormously important feature of our economic success. Uh, perhaps most importantly, uh, look at the evolving model of global production and what it means here. Now, there's no better example than our luncheon sponsor today, uh, Nike, and just for the sake of disclaimer, uh, let me say that um, Nike has not pre-cleared these remarks, uh, nor had any opportunity to uh, review them, and I was a little surprised to see their name on the door when I walked in because I thought someone might uh, think askance. But two months ago, I had the unique opportunity to visit uh, Vietnam and, among other things, took a factory tour at one of the factories that Nike hires to manufacture their tennis shoes. Before a shoe leaves uh, one of their factories, 200 pairs of hands will touch it during the manufacturing life cycle of 17 days. Because of rapidly changing shoe technology and design, something driven by you all as you purchase your shoes, uh, the way in which shoes are manufactured, which is to say, I know, it just keeps going on and off, unfortunately. The way in which shoes are manufactured isn't going to change significantly uh, over time. The uh, <clears throat> such detail in, in uh, sorry. Tap dance. Yeah, tap dance. Well, I'll just, uh, oh, there it is, okay. Back back again, back again. The gremlins, our port competitors, no doubt, are standing on the air hose back there somewhere. I think the point is that any manufacturing process that is so labor intensive, if attempted to replicate in this country, would mean that shoes would be priced at such a, a point that they would not be affordable. This is a business that wouldn't, it wouldn't exist. 
This once tiny shoe company born in Eugene in a garage employs more than 6,000 people now uh, out here in Washington County at their Beaverton uh, headquarters, and while the low-wage brawn, if you will, of manufacturing jobs may have gone overseas, the brains remain here, designing the popular U.S. products. In fact, Nike has never really been a manufacturer. They're an innovation and logistics company developing, marketing, and selling their products. Uh, and I think that's important because, oddly enough, this is a, a global system of production that this country, uh, that this company essentially invented. Uh, and here they are uh, in our midst. So what's it worth to a community to have a competitively successful global trader like Nike in our midst? The payroll, of course, is staggering. These are very high-wage jobs, but combined with the tax revenue that its employees generate, the amount it spends with local Oregon vendors, the charitable contributions it makes, the critical mass it has created in a highly skilled and very creative uh, uh, design and, and marketing profession, it's safe to say that we would be a very poor community without them. And if you look at the incredible cluster that has developed around so-called stitchwear, uh, athletic uh, clothing, and shoes, uh, it isn't here by accident. It's here because of the incredible critical mass that Nike, with its global system of production uh, and distribution, have created. Now, in addition, uh, and this is where it hits home for those of us at the port, Nike represents kind of the base customer for our air freight services to both South Korea and to China. So we, five times a week, uh, 747 air freighters take off from uh, Portland International, bound for both South Korea and for China, loaded not entirely, but significantly with thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds of air soles, which are the basic uh, technology inputs into uh, those very Nike shoes. Uh, and it's uh, clear that without Nike here, we would not have access, the additional access these represent to their uh, markets. They're a major customer at our container facility as well. And because they and other companies like them uh, are here, and there are many other companies like them, Lufthansa, Northwest Airlines, Hanjin Shipping, and other global transportation providers find it economically and financially viable to serve Portland where they might not otherwise. And because they've added that capacity in our market, other smaller businesses have access to them as well. The point here is that the lower cost production in places like China and Vietnam make possible the higher wage and higher value jobs in Beaverton at their headquarters. And because they're headquartered here, our community benefits in obvious ways, but also in ways that may not be so obvious. Nike is just the biggest and most obvious example, but other apparel and outdoor gear companies in this growing cluster rely on the same basic model. Local intellectual capital merged with global sourcing and assembly brought together by a global transportation system, part of which goes through Portland. Uh, and the model goes beyond apparel to all types of industrial sectors, from high technology to metal fabrication to automobiles. Uh, a, a brief digression, Boeing. Uh, will begin manufacture here in a, a year or so of their new 7E7, the so-called uh, Dreamliner. This is a, uh, the first new plane that Boeing has designed and will contract for the construction of uh, in probably 20 years for the commercial uh, market. Uh, it'll be constructed in Everett, Washington at a plant that will probably employ 1,500 or 1,800 uh, people. Contrast that, uh, frankly, uh, with the 737, which is manufactured uh, at a facility that employs somewhere between 15 and 17,000. The difference is that the, the pieces, the basic elements of the plane that will comprise the 77 when it's complete are being sourced all over the world and brought here from various locations to be assembled uh, in Everett. The design jobs, the engineering jobs, the software jobs, most of those uh, will be in the Seattle area. Some of those, by the way, will be here as well. But uh, this is high-tech manufacturing in the global age. And I would argue uh, that in the case of Boeing, it may well help them stay uh, a major and competitive player in the international uh, airplane manufacturing business. Uh, but it clearly is a different model than the one to which most of us are accustomed. Um, so what does all of this mean to us, and, and what do we have to do to sustain our role in this economy? 
And I think uh, I mentioned earlier the subjects of education and immigration. I feel very strongly about those. They're just not the primary topic of my uh, discussion today and, and perhaps uh, would, would uh, be a useful topic for the club in the future. Charles Darwin said, it's not the strongest of the species nor the most intelligent that survives. It's the one most adaptable to change. So I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing uh, to adapt. And let me talk a bit about uh, retaining and growing container services here in Portland, a subject that has been in the news uh, considerably. Um, now, you'll have to bear with me. This requires a bit of explanation. And I'm aware of the fact that this is not a topic on the tip of the tongue of most people who live in this region. Uh, it's an arcane, uh, complex, but I would argue immensely important tool of global trade. Containerized cargo has been around uh, roughly for 40 years and in Portland for about 30. Containerization has played an important part uh, in the revolution of global trade. It's efficient and it's very susceptible to improvements in productivity and in technology. About 13 million of these containers moved through the west coast of the U.S. last year. For Portland and our region, until recently, containerized cargo movement represented an important tool used to send a variety of agricultural commodities, primarily, from here to our primary Asian and Mediterranean markets, things like compressed hay and French fries and onions and dried peas, lentils and beans and, and so forth, which have been very important export cargoes for our region. In fact, unique among all container ports on the West Coast, we've been dominated by exports and not by imports. That's significant for really a number of reasons. Uh, there was a time actually when carriers came to Portland because of our exports mostly destined for Japan and brought with them whatever imports they could identify for this uh, relatively small local market. And historically, this has served us pretty well because we had access to those very important foreign markets. Uh, it meant a great deal to the agricultural producers and to the machinery manufacturers and, and others uh, because it gave them low cost and competitive access to those very uh, important foreign markets. Now, I think it's important to understand a basic uh, paradigm here. Uh, for container ports that are primarily export oriented, uh, they need to be relatively close to the point of production. That would be us, uh, in order to reduce the cost of inland transportation and distribution. Now, import oriented container terminals need to be close to the point of consumption. That would be Los Angeles. Uh, and that is for the same reason, to reduce the cost of inland transportation and distribution because the cheapest part of the journey any container takes is the, is the piece between the shores of the west coast of the United States uh, and Asia. On the water is the cheap part, on the ground is the expensive part. So locate these terminals where all of that can occur most efficiently. And while it is true that containers have long uh, dominated, uh, uh, well, imported containers have long dominated exported containers nationally, the recent growth in imports, particularly uh, from China, uh, has increased at an astonishing rate. And I'm sure that many of you read uh, stories recently about the congestion that is occurring in Southern California. And this is really what it's about, just an enormous and, and I would say not predicted rate of import growth, something that I believe has permanently uh, disrupted historical patterns and has very much changed uh, the situation for us in Portland in the container business. Now, because the laws of supply and demand have not changed, the revenue which carriers generate from U.S. imports is many times higher than the revenue generated for U.S. Uh, exports. And furthermore, uh, growth in imports has created a financial imperative for those carriers to get empty containers back to China as quickly as possible. And the sad truth is, in many cases, it is actually cheaper for the carriers to take an empty container from here to China than it is to load it with our lower cost agricultural products to send them to Japan first and then uh, to China, which is a pretty tough message to deliver uh, to the agricultural community and one of the challenges that we have in front of us. So the trade winds uh, have metaphorically left us 
somewhat marooned. Uh, this is what you've seen uh, at the port over the last few months, the loss of two of our three Trans-Pacific uh, carriers who essentially added Chinese ports, and in order to add calls, you've got to drop calls. And Portland, based on this historic paradigm, this dynamic, was a relatively easy port uh, to drop. So uh, I, I would say that the challenges historically we've faced uh, include channel depth. It is a big issue, one that we are obviously doing everything possible to address. The cost of hiring two maritime pilots to bring the vessel across the bar and up the river. Uh, the additional time involved in transiting 106 miles up and back to the mouth of the Columbia River. And then after you've done all of that, you arrive at what is the smallest market on the west coast of the United States with a container port, which gets in the way of that little uh, paradigm I introduced earlier, which is you want to you wanna be close to the point of consumption for, uh, for imports. So why am I bubbling with optimism? And with all these challenges, should we really care? Uh, let me answer the, the, the last question first. Yes, I think we should care. Terminal 6, which is the Port of Portland's uh, container facility, is a remarkable economic engine. Last year, the longshore payroll alone at Terminal 6 was $30 million. Business revenues associated with the operation of the terminal were over $100 million. If it were its own small business, it would be one of the larger ones uh, in our region. Uh, and it's an increasingly uh, important and rare source for high-wage, blue-collar jobs, something every vibrant community needs. And finally, we really do live in a just-in-time world, and this valuable community asset connects us to that world and allows us uh, a greater ability to compete. Now, the basic dynamic that I've just described is one that I believe will change and is in the process of changing. Uh, we need to have a container facility which exists here, which is in operation and in the best position to serve the needs of local uh, shippers. So the equation is really fairly simple, uh, not simple to resolve, but simple to state. Uh, <clears throat> to export goods, you need carriers. To get carriers, you need to attract importers. And to attract importers, you need to convince them, as we have done with people like Fred Meyer and Columbia Sportswear and Dollar Tree, to name a few, that landing their cargo in Portland is a reliable, efficient, and affordable way to get their products distributed to the rest of the country. Now, uh, this is a simple thing to say and a harder thing to do. It means developing a complex and sophisticated business case uh, that we're in the process of doing now and selling to major carriers and importers um, around the globe. And it's beginning to resonate because the congestion in uh, Southern California appears to be persistent. I don't think it's going to change. Uh, it's beginning to affect the Puget Sound as well. And therein creates opportunity, but I would also say challenge uh, for for us. It's in part what sold Dollar Tree on the idea of importing through Portland, and, and while they're here, they have built uh, a multi-million dollar uh, world-class international distribution center in our area. Uh, we're situated here on two class one railroads, two interstate freeways, and a vibrant river system, all of which give us superb transportation uh, connections. Now, I think uh, the, the maybe another way to think about it is this. Uh, the massive and, as I said, somewhat persistent congestion in other ports makes the relative inconveniences of serving Portland seem more modest by comparison. Uh, this is a, a conundrum that I think some have seen coming. Many thought it would, frankly, take longer to develop. But this enormous growth uh, in imports from, from Asia, which I believe are going to continue for some time, uh, create opportunities for our region. And if we're shrewd and wise, we will take uh, advantage of those. Um, we're not resting on our laurels, and I would say we're taking some risks. We're continuing to invest heavily uh, in the infrastructure around this terminal. Uh, the crane, the aforementioned crane built in China, I might add, seven and a half million dollars. Next low bid, South Korea, 13 million dollars. 
uh, no bids from the U.S. because these are cranes that are not built in the United States, just to give you a little perspective. Uh, we'll be adding to the length of our berths. Uh, we're adding to the rail efficiency of the terminal, all without an absolute guarantee that we'll have customers at the end of the day to take advantage of those, but knowing if we fail to make those investments, we won't be able to serve those customers when they are ready to arrive. We're also working very closely with Governor Kulingoski and other ports and shippers throughout the state to target key trade-related infrastructure. Uh, we've joined him in promoting a concept called Connect Oregon. Over the past several legislative sessions, significant investments have been made in the road system, but relatively few uh, in marine and rail, and we think it's time to address uh, that. Connect Oregon is not only a smart investment, it prom promotes the smart use of state resources. Uh, it'll require matching investments, uh, significant private investments, uh, in order to trigger any public expenditures. The public expenditures would come from the sale of bonds backed by the Oregon Lottery, which I would just add was the original intent of the Oregon Lottery when it was established by a vote of the people uh, more than a decade ago. So I want to leave you today with a, a simple message, I hope. Global trade can have significant advantage for, advantages for our economy. And at the port, with the cooperation of other regional local governments and uh, other important partners, we're investing to stay uh, connected to that global trade. Uh, these are advantages that will not automatically accrue to us. We must take action in order to take advantage of those. But before I close, I just want to stress that uh, we are very well uh, positioned uh, here as a course of geography and history, both working in our favor. Every now and then, I think it's important to kind of lift your head up uh, from the daily grind and, as President Jefferson said, look forward to distant times. Instead of the daily grind of immediate business challenges, uh, uh, pose the question, what do we expect the future to look like, and are we really doing what it takes to be ready? Just a couple of weeks ago, we had a fascinating uh, presentation from Dr. John Casarda, who is a professor of logistics at the University of uh, Carolina, talking about the growth of uh, uh, that business, uh, logistics, and how it relates to business location. And his essential thesis is that proximity to air transportation is a key driver for business location and success, and that we will increasingly see the development of industrial complexes around airports, a concept he calls aerotropolis. This is a little difficult to imagine in the confined spaces around PDX, but I think an important corollary is that speed, agility, and reliability in the movement of goods will be vital to businesses. And the regions which master that will have a key competitive advantage over other, reasons, other regions. We asked him to assess uh, our region's potential. That's really why we brought him here. And this is what he pointed out. We can make Portland a hub for 21st century multimodal commerce and catapult the region into global leadership in a, in a time-critical, high-value manufacturing and distribution world if we develop a strategy that targets speed, agility, and connectivity as the keys to business success, works to fully integrate air, sea, road, and rail transportation modes throughout the region, and utilizes innovative infrastructure and information technology systems to support high-tech manufacturing competitiveness and supply chain management, a mouthful uh, that's only three sentences on the page, but obviously a generation's worth of work. So I leave you with that thought today because of all the challenges the rapidly changing world of global trade throws our way, the bottom line is really this. Our region is uniquely positioned geographically, historically, and economically to thrive in this increasingly globalized world. Our job is to take advantage of that, to be aggressive, to see the future, and seize it. Thank you. That's why uh, City Club members are one of the most sought-after dinner guests in the city, because when we get to hear week after week after week of very intelligent and informative speeches like this. Um, you can see why we're popular. Incidentally, if anyone would like to, out of the kindness of their heart, uh, donate 
a city club sound system, you would forever be <laughs> memorialized in city club commons. I'd like to introduce uh, Susan Hammer now. She's our uh, Board of Governors uh, host today, and uh, Susan is a Portland attorney, mediator, and arbitrator, and she focuses on business and employment disputes. She's a fellow of the International Academy of Mediators, and she currently serves as vice chair of the Board of Trustees of Willamette University. After Susan asks her questions, please feel free to line up here to ask your own. And a question is usually finished with a question mark on a rising inflection, and it takes 30 seconds or less to ask. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Um, we hear a lot about the staggering losses that the airline industry is experiencing, the threatened bankruptcies of more than one airline, and the potential consolidation of routes. Um, first, how seriously do you take all this, and what do you think the impact of this will be on Portland? And then there's another part to the question about airlines, which is when do you anticipate we will have routes from Portland to China? Well, we take it very seriously, the state of airline health uh, at the port overall, 97% of our revenues come from business transactions. So these are our customers, and in the case of the airport, um, our customers pay all the bills. Uh, and so it's deeply concerning. We've got about 38 carriers, I think it is, at, uh, at PDX. Four of them are in bankruptcy, uh, and uh, including United Airlines. But even airlines that don't serve us that are in bankruptcy have an impact, U.S. Air, uh, which is, I think, my candidate for first one out of the door, uh, <clears throat> is in alliance with uh, United, Lufthansa, and others in the Star Alliance. And a, and a major alliance bankruptcy will have uh, effects on us. I would say, though, uh, whatever management challenges they may present us, we are accounting for that and doing what it takes in order to prepare for the potential disruption that major uh, bankruptcies would cause. And over time, I think Portland will be relatively unaffected, and here's why. For years and years, one of the big disadvantages that Portland labored with is that we were not um, a hub, uh, didn't have a lot of connecting uh, traffic here. And uh, I, I'll just tell you this one anecdote. Uh, I'd been on the job for about three or four months, and we're in the process of pitching Lufthansa, which everybody thought was a little wild uh, in a post-9-11 environment. So I went down to Phoenix. We were going to have a big meeting with them. And there was a huge uh, airline uh, conference there, all the certified smart people from around the world talking about what the future of the industry was going to be. And their answer was, the future of the industry is going to be all about hubs. <clears throat> so those of you who are from what we are, O&D airports, origination, destination, uh, not hub airports, you're just going to wait longer in these big airports. And I'll be honest, despite the success with Lufthansa, I came back a little depressed because uh, I was <clears throat> thinking, gee, I'd, I'd hate for that to be our future. And of course, I don't know, three months later, the world looked a little different. So being from Portland in this environment uh, is an advantage. There are airlines out there who are successful. Southwest Airlines just reported uh, a larger profit margin than I think the current book value for United Airlines uh, last year. So uh, they're an important service provider here. The real truth is that the major legacy carriers were created at a time when they lived in a regulated environment. Uh, and they have not been able to cast off <coughs> um, all of the costs that were created during that regulated environment. And, and I might say em employees, salaries, benefits, et cetera, that's not really what I'm talking about. The whole network system was established in a different time, and they have not successfully managed to shift that paradigm. So it's going to have a continuing uh, bumpy effect on the domestic industry. Uh, it, it is, if you've paid any attention to this, it's hard to, for airlines to die. I mean, it just is amazing to me uh, why we haven't seen a major one happen so far, uh, but it can't be far around uh, the corner. And in answer to your second question, how long will it be before we have nonstop service to China, 
I would just uh, point out that we have almost nonstop uh, service through Northwest Airlines uh, from Portland to Narita to an enormous hub there that they operate with uh, flights to nearly 21 cities uh, in Asia. So I've been to China on several occasions with Northwest through that hub. It works great. But with the growth in trade in China, um, I think uh, the day exists out in the future when a community like ours, a trade dependent community, uh, can imagine nonstop service. It'll just be uh, a ways down the road. Tom Cla uh, my name's Tom Cox, I'm a City Club member. Uh, I've got like five questions. I just want to ask you the one that's top of mind. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, unless someone else gets in line with me, I'll just keep hitting them. Uh, both, both the uh, the city, uh, I'm sorry, the, the the county of Multnomah and the state have uh, adopted this price of government approach to uh, to their budget. I haven't heard anything from the port on that. I'm wondering what the public cost benefit justification is for all the money that's going into dredging to go from 40 to 43 feet, when the modern standard's moving to 50 feet for container ships. Uh, wouldn't that be better invested in uh, deep water facilities in Astoria and rail links? Great question. Being from Astoria, you might imagine I've had this question uh, before. Well, the, uh, uh, with respect to the first part of your question about this book, uh, our system of budgeting, as I think I indicated to you, 97% of our revenues are business transactions. So we basically base our budget predicated on <coughs> uh, business forecast. Uh, what's our business going to be like? Uh, and if you paid very close attention, we just suffered a, uh, shall I say, a, uh, an interruption uh, in business service, which caused us to lose two-thirds of our uh, uh, container business uh, over the course of 30 days. And 35 days later, uh, we had eliminated $10 million from our annual uh, budget permanently. So uh, the port is uniquely structured. We're able to move very quickly, and we do. Uh, and I can assure you that today, uh, the port has not been in a stronger financial position uh, than it is at this very moment as a result of the actions that we have taken to address the uh, systemic uh, challenges. So our budget is different than uh, a typical public agency because it is dependent entirely on private business transactions. Uh, with respect to uh, the dredging question and, and Astoria, <coughs> Uh, I hardly know where to begin with this, but any container facility uh, has got to be commercially viable. There has to be a marketplace for it. So if you build the container facility in Astoria, and by the way, you're talking about, I don't know, half a billion, billion dollars uh, worth of uh, investment, um, and you can find a carrier who's interested in calling there, who thinks they can make uh, a, a case, they get to Astoria, and where are they? They're 106 miles from the smallest market on the West Coast with a container facility. So there is no infrastructure, there's no rail, there's no freeway. You've got to have all of those things to make a container operation uh, work. Uh, the new large vessels that you talk about that require the 50-foot uh, channel aren't coming to Portland anyway, and they wouldn't be going to Astoria. Uh, a ten, imagine this, a 10,000 TEU vessel, 10,000 of these big steel boxes landing in Astoria would unload them on a size of property that is about equal to the entire size of downtown Astoria. And I would say the, the biggest uh, impediment to developing um, a container operation uh, in Astoria is that no people, no land, no infrastructure, and finally, no commercial case to make it successful. So dredging, uh, the deepening project of the Columbia River is predicated on not just containers. It is uh, also predicated on the enormously important wheat trade, which has been our, our stock and trade in this region uh, for some time. Uh, vessels in the, uh, <clears throat> and the bulk vessels in the wheat trades 
are uh, developing into the Panamax variety, which is to say as large as they can possibly be and still get through the Panama Canal because they have to be multi-ocean uh, vessels. And we're not able to fully serve them. And we trades on pennies. Uh, and so the cost of transportation is an enormously important uh, part of the ability of our uh, exporters to compete. With respect to containers, I would just say this. Uh, right now, the global container industry is in the midst of a, uh, of a um, building frenzy, if you will, uh, which will conclude sometime next year. And they're building vessels which will shape uh, the industry for probably the next 15 to 20 years. 80% uh, of those vessels could efficiently and successfully operate in a 43-foot channel. And those are the vessels uh, that would make sense to come to our market in any event. The enormous vessels that are going to uh, go between, say, Shanghai and Los Angeles are not ever going to be interested in this market. And, and I would say, uh, even today uh, in Vancouver, which has natural deep water, or Tacoma, or Seattle, they're having an extremely difficult time managing the volume. Uh, and this is a little more than you bargained for, I suppose, but I would liken it to the difference between uh, air transportation and ocean transportation. One really significant difference. In air transport, the FAA comes around every so often and says, you need to do a master plan at your airport. We want to know how much capacity you have and what you're doing uh, to deal with your, your challenges. And we develop a master plan, and it's a big community process. Uh, very effective, and they do this at every major commercial airport in the country. There is no equivalent on the ocean side. So the terminal operators, they go out and build these enormous terminals, and the railroads do their thing, the truckers do their thing, and as it turns out, nobody really talked very closely with one another, and so as these enormous vessels arrive in Los Angeles and disgorge their cargo, there's no rail access, uh, the truckers can't get in and out, the neighbors are angry because of all the activity. Uh, and that is going to play in our favor. So there are enough vessels out there, an enormous fleet of vessels, that will be able to fully and efficiently function uh, in a 43-foot channel. And that's why we uh, are so strongly in support of it. A lot cheaper to do that than try and disturb the lower river estuary with the construction of a major international container facility. Hi, Bonnie Geo, Six City Club member. Thank you for coming. And I just had a clarification question, if you don't mind. You'd mentioned that Oregon is the eighth most trade dependent state and Washington was the first. And I would assume that that's based on dollar value of goods exported. But I'm wondering if you could clarify that and is it per capita adjusted? Thank you. It's, it's dollar value and in Washington, two, two words, Boeing, Microsoft, you know, uh, and uh, is it, is it adjusted for? No, just dollar value, which is significant, yeah. Bill, Joe Smith, City Club member, two quickies. First, a simple one. Back in, when I was in DC and then later, there was a constantly a periodic recurring problem of shortage of freight cars on the West Coast. I'm wondering, is that still a problem? And if so, what are we doing about it? Second, a tougher one. When and if, or when TSA finally begins turning its attention to the greater risk from standpoint of magnitude of sabotage through shipping as opposed to aviation. What is the port doing to anticipate that and also hopefully to head off some of the stupid things that they have done with aviation? Uh, well, there are partners, so stupid I won't say, but uh, rail cars, uh, there are continuing rail car shortages, uh, and uh, this is a subject I've learned a lot about, which wasn't hard because I didn't know much uh, to start with. Um, and it has to do with speed. So there are just, you know, X number of various kinds of rail cars in the United States. So many flat cars, so many bulk uh, uh, cars, uh, uh, and so forth. The slower they move, it seems, the fewer the cars. Uh, no big surprise. And speed is a big challenge right now. In the case of the Union Pacific, uh, this is a gross oversimplification, but I, I think this is uh, the essence of it. The Union Pacific failed to anticipate their labor needs. Uh, and as a result, there are a lot of trains hanging around at various parts of the country without crews. Uh, and so the cars are sitting there 
on the track, the engine's running, there's no crew, and the car isn't where it's supposed to be, which is either getting unloaded or being available for, for some other uh, purpose. Uh, and that is the primary uh, challenge related uh, at the moment to uh, access to rail cars. Uh, the BN has been a little more, um, I think, successful uh, at planning for this and, and managing uh, its, its future, but they're operating at, at pretty close to capacity right now in the system that they have available, and I think this is a, it's a big challenge for the, uh, for the United States. We've not really thought through carefully uh, the importance and the nature of the rail network. With respect to the TSA, uh, and so the point I think, Joe, is that the, the Union Pacific is hiring, um, and um, they're, they're doing everything they can to staff up. Um, it's a challenge, oddly enough, in a, in a state with uh, uh, unemployment as high as it is. They've had a challenge, frankly, finding uh, qualified uh, workers but they're slowly but surely uh, getting there. They're very important to Oregon. They earn 10% of their corporate revenue in this state, uh, which just tells you about the importance of, of rail um, in this region. With respect to port security, uh, two things. Um, first of all, we were one of the first major ports in the United States to get a, a, a so-called uh, good housekeeping seal of approval. Uh, from Homeland Security. We work closely with the TSA. There's a lot more going on in port security than most people realize, and I think a good part of that is it's just not everyday news. Uh, people who travel through the airports experience uh, the essence of security firsthand. Very few people have been on a state-of-the-art 21st century container terminal and can appreciate uh, what that means. We uh, are I, I think we're anticipating uh, primarily by virtue of uh, our relationship with the TSA, getting into their heads, where are they headed, what are they doing. Uh, we've acquired some new equipment. We have x-ray equipment now on the uh, facility. Uh, the Customs and Border Protection spent a great deal of time down on um, our terminal, and we're basically staying in very close touch with the federal agencies, our peers uh, in the port world with shippers. Uh, doing the best we can to, to stay ahead of that. And I would say progress is steady, but a long ways to go. Hi, Mike Dennis, City Club member. Uh, two quick things. First, I had the great pleasure of joining you on that inaugural Lufthansa flight, um, and uh, which was just such an exciting day for Portland and Oregon and Southwest Washington. So I was wondering, what is the port doing to maintain the international air service that we have now? And secondly, I've heard that the port of Portland's at a large or very large disadvantage or competitive disadvantage to Port of Seattle or Port of Tacoma, which have much stronger abilities to tax um, and raise taxes off of businesses and people than the port does. Uh, and I was wondering if you could talk about that. I've heard, for instance, that they can tax or raise 10 times more um, public money through taxes without, um, without having to go out for a public vote or anything. Okay. Uh, what are we doing to keep it? Uh, we have a uh, very high intensity marketing operation within aviation uh, focused specifically on these international services. We work very closely with the travel community uh, and we work particularly closely with the corporate travelers. I think people generally know this, but the reality is these services are built all around business class travel. Uh, so it is enormously important for them uh, to make their money in the front uh, of the plane. And for those of you who are regular coach flyers, I'm sorry, but you know they, they make their money up front. And so that's why we spend as much energy as we do working with the Nikes and the Freightliners and the Adidas and, and others uh, who really spend a lot of money on uh, business class travel. A lot of it's you know, problem solving and making sure that communications are, are good. We don't get in the middle of rate negotiations. That's a whole other proposition. So we work very closely with the carriers to identify opportunities for them here and, and make it work. Yes, it's true, Seattle um, has a huge tax base. We don't. That's life. We'll deal with it. Uh, we don't need uh, a larger tax base. Uh, 
and I think it would probably be a mistake in any event because it would cause us to head in, in the wrong direction. So they can have their $51 million, we'll take our seven and be happy with it. We have about time for one more question. Kurt, did you have a question before Tom gets to ask two? Okay. And this, uh, we have about two more minutes. I don't want to jump ahead of anybody. Okay. Uh, Tom Cox, City Club member. Uh, one of the ways that's been talked about to increase the capacity uh, for the, uh, the airport, Portland Airport, is to move some of the National Guard flights uh, to Hillsboro, which is the second busiest airport and is also surrounded by you know, urban development. Uh, is there any consideration being given to moving the Hillsboro Airport about five miles north out of the urban growth boundary and freeing up 1,000 acres for infill in Hillsboro and allowing for a larger Hillsboro Airport that could actually handle uh, an increase in traffic? No. <laughs> You know, just, I can't resist. Uh, a large airport requires a large runway, 10,000 feet. Seattle is building one right now, $1.4 billion. And the air transportation industry is just in no position to pay for that, because they're the ones who pay. People say all the time to me, hey, who pays for all that stuff out at the airport? And the answer is pretty simple. You fly, you pay. Uh, and so that's really the answer to it. There is no way to, to afford it. it. Hillsboro is where it is, and uh, if it ever becomes too much of a challenge for the community, we'll have to think of something else. But moving it is not really an option. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. That was a, a good suggestion, though, Tom. <laughs> uh, in any case, uh, thank you so much, Bill Wyatt, for a very enlightening uh, speech today, and please uh, let's see you here next week for our um, investigative reporter's outlook on what's happening with PGE. We're adjourned. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.